not possible for Labour to win a government and win power to change the country unless it's right at the centre of British politics. Simon Wright, is, is Jeremy Corbyn good for the Lib Dems or bad? Well, I think it opens up an opportunity for the uh, Liberal Democrats. There is now a gaping hole in the centre of uh, British politics, with Labour clearly moving to the left now, and the Conservatives out of coalition Wait, without so the moderating new, influence. Your new leader the is moving to the Liberal left, Democrats. Isn't he? Well, no, Tim's very much uh, a, a leader of the centre, the centre left perhaps, but very much the centre. And what matters is that we have a leader who can uh, communicate a strong liberal uh, vision for the future of this country. Uh, Tim is very well placed to do that. We've got our conference and I think that you will see Tim setting out a, a manifesto platform on which uh, the Liberal Democrats will uh, uh, clearly uh, stake a claim for the centre ground of British politics. So is Jeremy Corbyn good or bad for you? Potentially good. But we will see how it works out. I think that uh, uh, Labour have uh, perhaps... Um, <laughs> I think if they moved to the left, they've made a mistake. I think the biggest problem they had at the last election was economic credibility. And if Corbyn takes them further away from a position of economic credibility, I think that's big trouble for the Labour Party. Charles Clark, the, the supporters of Jeremy Corbyn will say that he has a mandate, and it, it is probably the biggest mandate that any leader has had. So, so can they be wrong? Well, they're absolutely right. He has got a mandate. There's no question about it. Uh, and I think he got the mandate for a very clear reason, that the other Labour candidates, Liz Kendall, who I supported, um, Yvette Cooper, Andy Burnham, appeared to be simply more of the same. And Jeremy Corbyn appeared to be the candidate of change. I liken it uh, to other movements like the SNP in Scotland backing um, Nicola Sturge and Alex Salmond, like Syriza in, uh, in Greece, like the Tea Party in the United States, like UKIP in some ways, of people who feel completely outside politics looking for a channel to express that concern of feeling outside and they found it in Jeremy Corbyn and he does certainly have a mandate. The question I raise is it's not enough just to complain, to oppose, to criticise what's going on, that's important, but it's not enough. You also have to have a path to how you're going to change the country. And I don't think that Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell have that. OK, we'll come back to leaders in just a little while. Uh, the Labour Party is not the only party to elect a new leader. This weekend, the first Liberal Democrat get together for their first conference with Tim Farron in charge. The party is licking its wounds after the general election. They lost three of their four seats here in the East. And in the local election, they were left with just fewer than 300 councillors. So does the party still have a future in this region? Andrew Sinclair has been finding out. We are Britain's oldest recorded city. Ever wondered what former MPs get up to? Well, Sir Bob Russell now runs heritage tours around his beloved Colchester. In this one spot, we can embrace 2,000 years of history. Uh, the oldest and largest surviving city wall we have a uh, Victorian church, a medieval tower, a 18th century top on the tower, and behind us, which every modern shopping area needs, a 20th century multi-storey car park. So we've got everything here. But are the Liberal Democrats themselves now consigned to history? A party of government reduced to just a handful of MPs. Well, obviously, uh, we, we took a kicking. It's a bit strange, isn't it, the, 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 the public um, blamed the, uh, the monkey rather than the organ grinder, and they've still got the organ grinder. But you're now the fourth party in Westminster. You're really small. Aren't the Lib Dems insignificant now? No, they're not insignificant. The, the foundations of the party are still there, very strong foundations, and we will rebuild on that. And I'm you're not depressed? Oh, I've, I've known better days. You could argue there is a lot to be depressed about. At Westminster, the Lib Dems have become almost invisible. No automatic speaking rights during Prime Minister's questions and ministerial statements. And when they do speak in debates, there's hardly anyone there to listen. Quite a few people here are asking, what's the point of the Lib Dems? I think, if anything, they become more of an irrelevance. The problem they've got is Tim Farron's plan, clearly, was to reposition the Lib Dems to the left of the Labour Party. The problem he's got is that Jeremy Corbyn is repositioning the Labour Party to the left of the Labour Party, and frankly that gives the Lib Dems nowhere to go. I hope to be the first of, uh, of many um, events where we can get together and talk... But the party still has believers, and they're growing. More than 2,000 new members have joined in the region since the election. Here in Norwich, membership is up by a third. I signed up four or five days after the general election, 
uh, because I was uh, just so disgusted with the way that the uh, voting population had treated them. I didn't really want to see the Liberal Voice of Britain sort of die away, so I joined up to uh, try and help it survive. Are you disillusioned when you think about the uphill struggle that your party faces? I do. I think we've lost some really, really talented uh, politicians, some really talented politicians. We have started already building at the grassroots with extremely good work going on in places like Cambridge, in Norwich, North Norfolk, Colchester. Absolutely wonderful uh, increases in membership right across the region. Maybe completely surprising, but it's been wonderful to see. The new leader believes the fight back has begun. Does and the East have a particularly special place in the Lib Dem strategy, or is it just one size fits all? It's a hugely important area to us. I mean, what's the what? absolutely important to us is you look at the eastern region, you look at it as being a, a community, a region that contributes, is a net contributor to the UK economy, one of only three regions in the UK that actually does that and that's because of the ingenuity, the creativity, the enterprise spirit of people in the eastern region and one of the key things for me at conference is making a pitch for the entrepreneurial spirit being the liberal spirit. They're still as you can see coming through here through, yeah. and it's the pace they... There is already one very successful liberal Democrat in the East, Dave Hodgson, Mayor of Bedford, is now in his third term and very clear about what the Lib Dems must do. Well, I think it's about making sure we keep the message clear and simple. Our message got diluted by the Conservatives in the last general election and it's actually making sure we tell our message and, and let people know what's happening. Of, of course we can become elective again. We've, we have uh, MPs, we have councillors, we have elected mayors as well. Um, but we've just got to get, keep on working and make sure we get our message across. But this is nearly 2,000 years old. The Lib Dems had to fight hard to establish themselves in the East. Can they do it again? Or like the Romans on Sir Bob's heritage tours, will they just become a part of the region's history? Earlier this week, I spoke to Norman Lamb, the only Liberal Democrat MP left in the East. He stood against Tim Farron in the leadership election, and I put it to him that James Cleverly believes that the Lib Dems have become irrelevant. <laughs> well, he would say that, wouldn't he? Uh, absolutely not. And. I mean, I, I think in a democracy it's critically important to have competition. If you have a one-party state, you have arrogance and you have complacency, and I think we're already starting to see some of that creeping in. Uh, so there needs to be a liberal progressive force that challenges the Tories. Labour has decided to shift dramatically to the left, the hard left. Uh, that's their right. Uh, but that means that there's a gaping hole uh, in the middle of British politics and there's a party there that has the potential, <clears throat> doesn't mean that we will succeed, but it has the potential to, fu to fulfil the absolute need for a progressive alternative to the Tories. See, one Conservative MP said to us this week, if, if the Lib Dems didn't exist, there wouldn't be a reason to invent them. Well, I think there absolutely is the need to, uh, to invent them, to... Uh, to protect the interests uh, of the individual, uh, of communities against the power of central government, uh, against the power sometimes of unaccountable institutions. But what you were saying is that there are people on the, the left of the Conservative Party and people on the right of the Labour Party who would be in tune with what you're saying, which means you are not distinctive. Well, no, because there, n neither of those parties will make that case. There are individuals within the party who fight against their own parties. But you need a party making the case for a liberal, fairer society. Uh, and I think what my, my sort of mission, as it were, and, and the, the case I put for in my bid, my failed bid to be leader of the party, was that we must build a liberal progressive force in British politics and that the Lib Dems must be at the heart of that. How disappointed were you not to become leader? Uh, well, mixed feelings, to be honest. I mean, it was frustrating to get actually rather close. Uh, everybody had said uh, throughout the campaign, it's a foregone conclusion, Tim is bound to win. We actually got very close, got 43 and a half percent from a standing start. I hadn't even planned a leadership campaign. This was literally a decision I made straight after the election. But there are enormous compensating factors for not winning, like uh, some quality of life, some yeah, more on, time with my on. family. No, I've known you a long time. You're a, co you're a competitive politician. And that yeah. means a competitive com uh, politician wants to have the best job. The best job is leading the party, isn't it? No, well, interestingly, because the, the job that I loved and I had a passion for was the job in 
health because uh, <clears throat> I have a I have a passion for achieving or for ending the historic injustice suffered by people who suffer from mental ill health. I didn't spend my life uh, aspiring to the top job. I, I, I go into politics to achieve things, genuinely. That's what I'm here for. But you can achieve more as leader than you can doing anything else, surely. You can achieve most in government. That's the key thing. And that's why I always aspire well, to the Well, what you Lib achieved Dems. in government this time was to have your party virtually wiped out. Yeah, but we achieved some real things for people. That's making a difference to people's lives. That's what I'm interested in. So what do you hope to achieve? at the conference this year. Will it, will it be a bloodletting or will it be a coming together? It's certainly not a bloodletting. Uh, I, I mean, uh, it, it's to get across the country that we're relevant, uh, that we absolutely need a liberal progressive force to take on the Conservatives and that we can be the fulcrum of a movement of change uh, that delivers competition and, again, the, a, a fairer option for this society. Mr Lamb, thank you. Thank you. Simon Wright, Lib Dems lost 65% of the vote in the East at the general election, lost 60 council seats. Um, there, there should be some bloodletting, shouldn't there? We, we had a really tough time. There's no getting away from it. The election, in many respects, was a, was a di disaster, losing so many MPs, 49, I think we lost. But every sign since that election has been a positive one. It's been a party getting back on its feet, wanting to rebuild and confront the challenges that are ahead of it. We've would, seen would a you massive have a boost in our membership, yep. up 18,000 across the country. Would you be, have a better chance of doing that if Norman Lamb was your leader? We were really lucky um, to have two very, very good candidates yes, for okay. the leadership Would of you the be party. Better off I personally supported Norman because I think he's a man of ideas, he's a man of great principle. He is the person who I knew would take the party forwards in a strongly liberal direction and more than that had the track record in government of he actually would, delivering on, on many of those things He would take you down that too. centre road rather than further to the left. Well, yeah. I, think I think both Tim and, and Norman are broadly similar in, in, in much of their politics. They're both liberal uh, thinkers. Um, there are differences over style, All and right, Norman has achieved a great deal in, in government, let's ask but the we have two good on, candidates. On political leaders, would they have been better off with him than Tim Farron? In my opinion, yes. Uh, there's a model that we use in the books about political leadership which talks about a good leader having to have clear electoral strategy, uh, how to win, fewer have than you might think sense of competence in government, which as Simon's just said is something that Norman uh, certainly did have, an ability to keep the party united and together, and being in tune with the times. If you take those four criteria, personally, I mean, I'm not a Liberal Democrat, I think Norman Lamb was nearer having those than Tim Farron has. We've talked a lot about that middle ground, and he, he, that, that's the place where you think all politicians should be fighting, is all good leaders should take their parties there? Uh, you have to address the issues of the middle ground and you have to be in a position to talk seriously about the concerns of people. So if you look at the big th things people are worried about, immigration, the welfare state, the ageing society, climate change, globalisation economically, you've got to have answers as to what government should do in relation to these various challenges which people can say, well, we can go with that and we understand that. And because they're all difficult questions, and they are all difficult, uh, many politicians shy away from them. They, they just say, they take a stance rather than try and offer a solution. And I think what people want is politicians and political parties which offer solutions. And that's by definition more complicated, more difficult than just getting out there and campaigning. Are you expecting some answers from, from this weekend for your, from your conference? Or do you think that this is, this is going to be one where people argue out? I think this will be a positive experience for the party. We've got a lot of new members, more new members going to this conference than we've had at any previous uh, conference. Our membership is up very significantly as, as a whole, and many of those attending the conference will be first-time attendees. What I want to see from Tim and from the party is a real sense of principled opposition, where we don't sacrifice the credibility of what we could bring to a government, but where we are putting in place ourselves as a clear uh, alternative to the, the Conservatives, the, um, but from the centre ground. The thing is that you are at such a low level now that nobody's listening. So how do you establish that new identity? Well, what we have to do is put in place the base of ideas that can take us forward. Now, occupying the centre ground doesn't mean you have to be bland and wishy-washy with, uh, with your policies. But you can be very radical listening. from the centre ground. And I think when you look at what we did achieve and what we did take forward in, in coalition, you know, some of the work that Norman did, for example, in, in, in mental health in particular, really marking that out as a policy area to develop and deliver on, then I think that in that battle of ideas, you can be there in the centre ground, and that's how we have to re-establish ourselves. Getting heard is the problem, isn't it? It's a massive problem, and there's a big issue with the media on that as well, because the media sets its own agenda about what is hearable and what is not, if I can put it like that. 
But uh, actually, I agree with Simon. You've got to, on the big issues of the day, you've got to be putting forward a set of policies which aren't just a, um, a stream of complaint about the state of society, but a program for politics and political change which says we can make changes in these ways. And the reason why the listening doesn't happen is if people think that politicians are just whinging and not saying this is what you've got to do. Just